and grip snapper. If you don't have an offshore boat, you have a bay boat, it's the easiest thing to do. It's right here in the bay. He may not give you specific spots, but he might give you a good area. But he's going to give you the tips and tricks to it. So without any further ado, Captain Ty, it's all your fault. Somebody, Captain Darrell Patasol, too. We're going to have him come up here. If it were a snapper tournament and he entered against me, he'd be about the only guy I'd have to worry about inside the bay. Um, so much as to getting started on how we catch these things, I told him to get a rod ready with uh, what he would do to catch snapper at the bridge. And I mean, I think we're pretty much the same on it. So we'll go over how we got to that. But mangrove snapper, especially with a band on uh, snook red and trout, it's a great fish you can keep. Um, the limit is five per person inshore up to 10 inches or a minimum of 10 inches and then offshore it's 10 per person uh, minimum of 12 per inch, uh, 12 inches. So mangrove are a very aggressive fish that like to hold tight to structure. Structure being rocks, seawalls, docks, um, bridge pilings, anything like that. You're gonna to wanna to look for moving water. You're gonna want some current. Doesn't have to be a lot of current, but they feed a little better when the water's moving and things are passing them by. Um, targeting specifically, I like to use live bait primarily. Um, shrimp, small white bait, small thread fins. Uh, even sometimes little black crabs you can get on the pilings when you're using it for sheep's head. They'll eat those as well. Um, we're gonna have Daryl, you wanna come up here with me? And basically, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. There's no real formality to this. Just you know, shoot them out there as we go over things. Primarily, I'm using, I like seven, six rods, but seven foot rods work too. You want to pass around? Yeah, good. Uh, light tackle. Knocker rigs. Sensitive. The uh, snapper like to chew the bait. They don't really, I mean, sometimes they'll hammer it and you'll feel them right away, but they're, they're kind of going to snap at it. So you, the, the more sensitive the rod is, the better chance you are going to feel that bite and, and be able to set the hook a lot more or get them on the hook a lot more. Um, starting, if we were going out today looking for some snapper, uh, well, first thing I'm always going to look at tide. Find my tidal movements and the lunar phase. On a new and full moon, you do get a lot better snapper bite. Um, they're more active, they're out spawning, so they're a little more aggressive. You can probably put a better limit inside the boat doing so. Um, the uh, Oh, um, oh yeah, so yeah. Checking my tides before I get out there. So I want moving water. Typically, my favorite tide to fish them is the top of the incoming, and then the beginning of the outgoing. That's when I like to fish very shallow spots for them. So I'm I'm free lining baits up under mangroves, under docks, rock walls, things like that. Downtown Tampa is a great place. The Skyway Bridge is a, is a great place. You have the, the bunkers. Um, you also have the pilings. They hold very tight to the pilings. Uh, for instance, the other day we were tarpon fishing, tarpon didn't seem that they wanted to eat at all, so we switched over to snapper fishing, and uh, we got a three-man limit in about two hours, and none of the fish were below 17 inches. So, for inside the bay, those are great mangrove snapper, and if you, you know, 15 of those, you can have a nice fish fry. I mean, it was a gallon-sized bag that went home with us. So, you know, very easy to target, very tasteful fish open year round so you never have to worry about the closures um, and this time of year is the specific time of year to target them. When the hottest months of the year here, our bay fishing for snapper is one of the best in the region. Um, for instance, we you know you get a, we cast out our bait so we go to a lot of towers and stuff that are in the bay and this time of year if you start putting chum out there you'll actually see a red cloud come up sometimes. There won't be any snapper or any bait fish there but the schools of snapper will move on to the towers as well. So there's many, many places you can target them. Whether you're in a kayak, fishing from a bridge, fishing from shore, or in a boat where you can move around, you know, about. So Daryl is a little more of the deeper fisherman. He likes to fish like channel ledges, um, rock piles that are in the bay that he has. I've actually been trying to get one from him for a little while. He still won't give it to me. But uh, it's, there's certain ways you want to attack the uh, situation of what the, what the snapper you're fishing. So if you're fishing deep water, obviously you're gonna want to use something like this with a knocker rig or a jig head, something to get the bait down in the water column. So um, obviously if you have a, a really strong current, the heavier the weight or jig head you're gonna want to use. The day we were fishing, actually this is the setup we were fishing when the tarpon weren't, wouldn't eat and current wasn't ripping very bad. So we threw, uh, I think that's a 
Quarter, quarter ounce, ounce or a half, yeah, yeah quarter ounce um, knocker rig to a, a two watt circle hook and 20 pound leader. Snapper are very, very leader shy. They have excellent, excellent eyesight. So if you feel like you get a couple and the bite shuts off, dial down your leader, dial down your hooks. They're, they're getting smarter to what you're doing, so you have to change it up a little bit to get them fired up. I do know that Daryl likes to use a lot of chum bags to bring the fish off the bottom or the structure, which you can go ahead and let them know about yeah, that. Yeah, I use, I use chum bags. Um, and I use a lot of chum, actually. When I go get the bait, I get a lot of bait. I get a lot of bait, and I fill a five-gallon bucket up for dead bait. Uh, and I chunk it, and I cut it up, just like you would talking fish or anything else. And I chum, you all right, bud? And I chum heavy, you know. Um, if I'm on some structure or something, I'm on the edge of the uh, shipping channel. Everybody knows the shipping channel, so um, that's a great area to start looking. Do your homework, go out every bottom machine, go on the edges, look for structure, all right? Anytime you see, start seeing some structure out there, mark it, you know what I mean? Mark it, and, and you start seeing fish on it, mark it. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean you have to fish it right away. Mark two, three spots, four spot spots. There's spots all down that, all outside of Tampa Bay, you know, Port Mantee Reef, everywhere, I mean. So just mark it, go back, do your homework, and, um, and get on it on the incoming or outgoing tide. I personally like the, like Ty said, the, the top of the incoming and the first out going. Favorite ways to do is I like to chum them up. When the tide's starting to slack up a little bit, I like to get them snapper up off the bottom. My favorite way is to freeline for them out there in that deeper water. I love it. It's my favorite Getting way to catch the them. Surface. Yep, I love to see that, that red cloud come up. You know what I mean? Just freeline that bait into that slick where I got going. You know what I mean? And, and what I mean by freeline, you're gonna click your bell and let it just start pulling off line. Start pulling off line. Just let it let that that chunk of bait or live bait you got going, let it go back in there naturally. Just like you would be snapper fishing in the keys or yellowtail or whatever. Just let it go back in there naturally. And uh, that's my favorite way to catch them. So Alright. Um I like I said I, I prefer the shallower water. I have a lot of spots that are anywhere from four to maybe seven to ten feet. Uh, those are dock pilings, um, rock piles near downtown Tampa. I'm not gonna tell you exactly where, but obviously when you're going into the channels at Paul, or, uh, Palm River and the Hillsborough River, you have all these rocks that run down there, or down the, uh, the channels. Those rocks are perfect habitat for snapper. So they're going to be there. Like you said, do your homework, bump down the rocks if you have a trolling motor. If you have a kayak with a trolling motor, you're better, you can be pretty quiet. Um, and fish the rocks till you find a good snapper bite. Once you find a good one, within, I don't know, like 12, 15 inches. Once you start finding those size fish, there are gonna be plenty more there with them. They are a schooling fish. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're packs, they, they, you know, there's gonna be multiple ones. You might catch one or two and the bite will shut off, but again, that's when you're gonna dial it back, try to change what you're doing, see if you can get them a different look, and then you'll start catching a lot more snappers. So I'm gonna ask you a question real quick though. Yeah. So most of the time, this time of year, you got the tide going this way and the wind going that way. Yep. How do you get on your spot if you don't have one of the eye pilots? They're anchored up. How do you get them on, on that spot? Do you know they went over it and on the bottom machine, they saw a nice little hill of it. How would you sit there and tell them to anchor so they're on that spot when you got tired? You're gonna wanna get to you're gonna wanna get your anchor heading. So even if that's killing the motor and watching your GPS and just seeing which way the wind and the current are gonna either either the wind's gonna overpower the current or the current's gonna overpower power the wind. Or you might get lucky where the one's working towards the other where it keeps you pretty much right in the same spot at the same time. So what I would do is find out my, my anchor heading and then set up to where I can hopefully fish those, you know, drift my baits across the structure. So if your current is moving from north to south and you got a west wind, I'm gonna try to get in that northwest corner so I can actually drift my baits across the structure or to the structure. You don't ever want to throw it right on top of the structure. You want it to be presented to that structure naturally because they're gonna ambush it just like any other predator fish would. Uh, some of the things I would use too, depending on current and tide and wind, split shots. So split shots, depending on the size, depending on how, how strong the current is or how heavy the wind is. Also weighted corks. I like to use a lot of weighted corks once I get them feeding off the surface, especially if it's windy, if you can make a better cast with a weighted cork a little more accurate. I always use one or two-watt circle hooks. If I'm fishing the Skyway Bridge with deeper areas, I like to use two-watt hooks because you can get a little better snapper. We got big grunts inside the bay, so there's a lot more things you might be able to hook fishing that bottom. 
So you're going to want to have a little bit of bigger hook on there. Inshore, strictly one knot. And that's, you know, anywhere from seven to four, three or four feet of water. Fishing under mangroves on a high tide is a great great time to try to get mangrove snapper. Sometimes when they get finicky, you got to downsize to size yep. one. Yep. You know I, mean? um, I always start with at least 20 pound leader. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter. They'll, they'll eat every bait on that leader and some, go ahead. How long is the leader? Uh, snapper, I usually use about five to six feet, almost the length of the rod because they have great eyesight. So like when I'm offshore, I'll actually have 20, 30 yards of monofilament on my reels and then to usually 30 pound braid offshore when I'm fishing for those fish. But you want to have a good enough leader to where they're not going to see that braid or that thick mono, whatever you're using with your leader um, behind it. Uh, it. They are finicky. You can lose a fish and seem like the bite will shut down. So you want to try to make sure you have the adequate leader to get those fish out of the rocks that they're living in because they'll eat your bait and swim right back into the rocks as fast as possible. Kind of like grouper will. So if you have you know 15 pound leader and you get broke off quick, well now it might shut the bite down on those fish. So I always try to start with a 20 pound leader and go lighter. Um, and again, four to six foot a leader is fine in short. You're not really going to need any more than that. Um, especially when I'm fishing four feet of water, obviously, you know, four feet of leader will work fine. But, uh, so we got 20 pound leader, split shots or knocker rigs like this. Basically it's, I tie a uni to uni from my leader to my line and just slide a, like I said, that's a quarter ounce um, slide weight right to a, a uni knot to my circle hook. And that pretty much is my go to uh, fishing rig. You ever seen the yellow jeep out here? Yeah. It's starting to rain though. Is it really? Yeah. Catch snap right out of his Jeep in a little while. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions for, you know, as we're getting going? Any other tactics you guys want to look at? How do you hook the live bait? Uh, live bait, when I'm snapper fishing, I always hook in the, uh, right behind the pectoral fin on the belly. Most of our baits, I wish I had one. Yeah, we don't have one. So, yeah, yeah, even like a... They got the, uh, what are the fake lures? The I got you. live target. Those are perfect. So they have the pectoral fin. That's the fin that they use to swim, turn left and right with. There's a little air bladder. You, if you go put the hook right behind that pectoral fin, you almost hear them like make a squeak sound. You're piercing an air bladder that they have. It's not a, an organ that they necessarily have to live with. So one, they'll live for a long time. You can cast them a lot further than hooking them through the nose. And when I'm snapper fishing inside the bay, I'm looking for baits that are two inches max anything maybe even three inches because some of the snapper do get bigger but the bigger you know white baits you get that are four five six seven inches those snapper are going to be timid from those baits unless it's injured or wounded then they'll all hit it together kind of like piranhas so i'm hooking them right here behind this pectoral fin that's on the side of them and what that does too is that that hook will help draw that bait down into the water column more because he's going to naturally try to swim to the top because he's trying to get away from whatever's down there so hook them through that little, just a little spot. It, the, the hook will slide through easier than any place on that fish. So you'll it know when you have it, it just pops right in. You'll hear a little bit of a squeak. That's just you piercing the air bladder. And that's how they use their buoyancy, just like a, you know, scuba diving with a buoyancy compensator. So now they no longer have that, they're gonna sink a little better than you would, get them down in the water column, and usually you'll get a good bite. Um, do you slip the tail at all? Just yeah, I was gonna say it. don't so don't be stop, a, yeah. Depending, you, yeah, you can slip the tail. Depending, you can cut them to wound them. Obviously, a, a wounded fish is an easier opportunity for him to eat, so they're probably gonna do it. Uh, when I'm fishing with shrimp, especially in the winter, when I'm trying to find snapper, I always pinch the tail. Snapper do pick up scent, so I feel like when you pinch the tail on a shrimp, you get that scent in the water a little more. Um, I like to tail hook shrimp. That way, they can still move and make that clacking sound when the horn hits the back of their body and that will attract fish as well. Um, chumming is... You gotta be careful. Yeah, I mean you, you can overfeed the fish and they'll shut off on you. Um, generally when I'm fishing in shallower spots that I, I know are good mangrove holes, I like to pull up, throw a good 20-30 baits out there. Disorient them first, I have a bat. I don't know if you guys have the bat or not, but it's just a Wolfle bat that they cut at an angle and put a ping pong ball inside. So that's how those bats got started and someone got smart enough to, to manufacture them in China for 10 cents. So anyhow, I'll put some baits in a bat, I'll shake it around to disorient them and scatter them out across where I'm fishing. And what that does is all those baits shooting in different directions, 
that gets those snapper fired up. They're like, oh my God, all these you know injured bait fish are here, and they start competing over baits. And that's when you'll have them up to the surface in shallower water, and they'll start feeding, and then you just free line baits in there, or you can use corks, um, weighted weighted corks is what I use when it's pretty windy. And then I'll, I'll leave a good four to five foot underneath that cork. So that way that, that bait can still drift in the water column and get down to the, to the rocks if it has to, to get those snapper if they're a little, a little you know, bluebird sky, they're gonna be a little more apt to coming up to the, to the surface to feed. So you're gonna wanna get a little deeper with it. Do you find the live bait are more productive than <coughs> cutting bait? Yeah, fresh bait. Inshore, Cut absolutely. Them. Inshore, I primarily like to fish with live bait. I really don't use a lot of cut bait unless we're fishing a deeper rock pile in like 15, 20 foot of water, a ledge in the channel. Once you get those fish chummed up, they're pretty much going to eat anything at that point. Cut bait, shrimp, crabs, white bait. So, yeah, once you get them behind the boat or off of the structure, that's going to be uh, pretty much feed out all time. Um, your current also is going to help with that. Like he said, he likes that slack tide. When the current's strong, the fish hold tighter to the structure. It's the same principle if you're trolling for gag grouper. You're going to get a better bite if you're trolling plugs around on a slacker tide because those fish are more willing to come off that structure a little higher. Same with the snapper. If it's a really strong tide, they're going to be really tight to the structure. You're going to need to fish the structure, basically. So you're using half ounce eggs, dropping it down on the edge of the structure. and What I do is I, I once I feel that weight hit the bottom, I'll actually feed off about 10 more feet of line. That allows the weight to stay and the bait to actually pull away from it. So when he pulls away from it, that snapper eats it, I can see my line start peeling, and then at that point, you just close the bail and start reeling. If you're using circle hooks, every time in the corner of the mouth. Everybody that's, know what a knocker rig is? Yeah, we yeah, pass it around. Anybody not know what a knocker rig is? Oh, you pass it around? Yeah, we pass it around. The one thing I will tell you, do not take <clears throat> the frozen chum out there at all. As soon as you put that frozen chum bag in the water and it starts to grease out, you will have sharks all over you like white on rice. It is bad. You can sit there and be free line. Next thing you know, it's screaming. You think you've got a monster on. Next thing you know, it goes pink. Guaranteed it's a shark. Yeah. Or dolphins. Dolphins, especially at the Skyway. It's, dolphins are bad. We probably last weekend lost 15 good fish to dolphins. And it's, it's just a part of the game. It's a circle of life. They're bigger, faster, stronger. And I mean, they're so smart that they'll sit there and almost look at you at the top of the water. And when you throw your bait in, they go down with it. And you're like, okay. So as soon as he eats it, I'm over there just turning and burning, trying to get that thing to the surface so I can get him in the boat. But uh, it, you know, you got to play your cards right. Pay attention to your wind, your tide, your current. If you fish, if you get all that dialed in, and you find where the snapper are, you're gonna have no problem filling a cooler or getting a couple guys limits and being able to do do it in enough time where you can go fish for snook reds and trout or triple tail or cobia or whatever else. Because that's generally what I do in the summer on a charter. If they want fish to take home, first thing I go is a snapper hole. I go to my snapper hole, I try to set up, get what I can for them to take home or if they just wanna have lunch for that day. And then we were off to fishing other places. I believe the last time we took Tiger, we had a three man limit within two hours. You had to drop me back off at the yeah. boat ramp. Yeah, I dropped me back off. And again, that's just fishing. And that, actually that day, artificial. we were fishing Daryl's way. He had a chum bag, he got him up off the bottom and. I mean, they you're were, literally were. pitching the baits off the back of the boat right to snapper eating them five feet off the motor. So you can you can get them dialed in and get them drawn up to where snapper fishing is honestly one of my favorite things to do. One, you look like a hero when you're a charter captain and you go and smash a bunch of snapper and you're like, oh, foot, you know, cooler's filled, now it's time to go find something else. So it's uh, definitely a great way to, to spend your time. My kids, they love snapper fishing. My son will tell you he's caught a bigger fish than everybody in this room I'm sure <laughs> as he looks up <laughs> so you do you come fishing with us one of the best eating fish out there yeah absolutely in the bay how often because mangrove snapper came from because they mostly they're born underneath mangroves so how how much better or worse is it if you find a nice deep trough that runs under the mangroves? Like I know a couple down further south shore. Mm -hmm. What is the more likelihood, or what is your productivity in those type of spots? Um, it's filling them out. It, you, once you find a spot with snapper, you have to fish it to find out what's there. Um, like I said, if you fish a spot and you catch three or four at you know five to six to eight inches, more than likely you have a bunch of schooly small ones there, and there might be a couple big ones, but you're really not going to find the ones you're looking for. 
So you want to fish the spot out if, if you're, you know, you're catching a bunch of good ones or you catch three or four good ones, more than likely those fish are going to be a bigger size. They're bullies. They don't allow the other fish to kind of hang out with them as much. If, if you're that much smaller than me, I can take the food from you. I can push you around. I can push you out of my rock hole. So the size fish you're looking for, once you find them, they're generally going to be more there. Now mangroves, it kind of depends on what's there, how deep the hole is, how big it is, is there oyster bar attached to it, are there rocks, um, most mangroves obviously have oysters attached to the bottom, so um, like that's going to attest to, to the condition you're fishing in, the, you know, what you're, the structure you're fishing. How many people have a, know of a good deep, at least five to six foot trough underneath it, right next to a mangrove in the south shore? Do a lot of when you guys are doing regular fishing for, for your redfish and snook, as you're rolling through, if you find a nice deep hole, where usually if you're fishing in mangroves, you can see the bottom. You can see nothing but sand, shell. If you see where it gets a little bit deeper because that water is a completely different color, try it. Worst case scenario, you're going to catch a redfish, but you drop in there for a couple mangoes, you may sit there and pick up a couple mangoes. Because I can tell you right now, <clears throat> there's spots in the south shore all the way past Cargill's spot that I can go and sit there low, load up probably four or five cut baits, throw it in there, two minutes later put it on a little one-off hook, no weight, no nothing. If the tide's coming in, I'll drift it up tide and as it slows down, as soon as it gets to here, it's fish on. And it's literally only about six feet. There's spots that are ten feet in that area. So just play with it. I mean, it's one of those things as you're going, have a rod set up for, all right, this is going to be my snapper rod for today. That way, because you never know, you're sitting fishing for a snook, next thing you know, you're catching a whole bunch of mangrove snapper, you got lunch, and then you sit there and hook a snook on the other side, it's a great day. Tidal flow is good. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Where, wherever you have points, mangrove lines that have a lot of water movement, that water movement's going to cut a channel. It's going to clear out the uh, sand and debris, which gives you those deeper troughs. Again, the bigger, the deeper the trough, the more you're probably going to find several fish in. If you have a little trough that's as long as this, you know, um, bookshelf and it's three feet deep and a foot on the flat, you might be able to catch a lot of fish there, but I just wouldn't expect to catch, you know, a three or four man limit. But you could probably put five or six good mangoes in the boat, which still makes a heck of a fish fry. So, we talked about catching them on the tide wise. What are your opinions on the moon phases? Full moon's best. Full moon. And if it's a full moon, I'm trying to go at night because the snapper are out spawning, they're more aggressive, and the bigger ones are, they're, they're coming up to the top. Um, actually, Bahia Beach Reef is a great place to snapper fish on a full moon. You can act, we've gotten 24 inches off of them before. So, I mean, again, it's the right place, right time, finding the, the right rocks, but um, we took my son out on a full moon last year, and he actually ended up hooking his biggest tarpon ever so far. So you never know what you're going to get again. And that goes back to using two odd circle hooks, because I'm fishing deeper water, bigger structure. There's a, I mean, there's guy grouper on there sometimes. So you want to you want to make sure you have the right equipment to catch what you're fishing for and what's possibly going to be there as well. But if your moon phases, full moon's best. Two days before the full moon, two days after. And nighttime would be your primarily your your best time to primarily target them over um, deeper structure. Uh, a lot of people like to run offshore on the full moons. Like uh, for instance, we had a good moon on the opening day of Red Sna or Gag Grouper. So everybody went out the night before, tried to get their limit of mangoes, and then by 12:01, now you're gag fishing legally. So um, legally, <laughs> legally, yeah. <laughs> There's people that do it illegally. <laughs> I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just saying legally. <laughs> Um, any other questions so far on uh, tactics or even general areas? Uh, Skyway Bridge, everybody knows about the Skyway. It's a great place to catch mangrove snapper. Um, you can bump the pilings and just keep fishing them. You know, what I like to do, especially on the hot days like this, is I'll put my anchor out to where I set up, to where I'm actually under the bridge. So now we're in the shade fishing and, you know, we're catching snapper all day. I keep my wife happy for hours doing that I mean literally for hours and she you know she likes the snapper so it's a great thing you can do with family and friends and you know pretty easy to target and and have a good meal and a good outcome out of it have a good day everybody know good areas especially mangrove snapper fish here in the bay most of you guys sit there and fish out of the south shore go out of cockroach or Williams or stuff right Me too. anybody that go out of Gandy 
at all? Gandy? <clears throat> Gandy Bridge? Gandy Bridge, great. Great yep. spot. Even great the Hula spot. Bay Island. Hula, Desperation yep. Island. Yep. It's it's all rocks on the that would be the east side of the island. And we've caught really good snapper in there because they, they hang out on them rocks and on them structures. Especially in the winter. For some reason you don't really have them as, as abundant as you do in our hottest months. So May, June, July, August, that is our snapper go-to time, for, especially for charter captains in the bay, because they are so thick. Um, but in the winter, as long as you find, I like to fish uh, like rock piles that are pretty shallow, those rocks hold heat. The heat bring in the snapper and the trout. So you actually go snapper fishing and end up catching a mess of trout as well over some, over some rocks in the winter. And then I primarily use shrimp as well. When the water temp's like 65 or lower, I'm trying to fish with shrimp. One, because I'm not trying to throw the net and be freezing all day. Um, but shrimp is, is the, you know, the bait of choice at that time because that's what's more abundant at that point. A lot of our bait is dispersed. It's in deeper water trying to find that warmer water or heading south. So um, the wintertime fishing, I'm primarily using shrimp for when I'm snapper fishing. Can you stay away from us duck hunters? It's even better. Sometimes. Shot across the bow. Shot across the bow. I got hit with the <laughs> last year. I don't know what you're talking about. Shrimp in the summertime. I've got a bad back, so I just can't throw it past that. Any okay. Recommendations of how I can snap a fish with shrimp. Yeah. Go bigger on the shrimp. Go bigger on the in the shrimp. summer. Go bigger on the shrimp. This is a more presentable bait. Okay. Um, again, like I said, I like to pinch that tail off, and then when I'm using shrimp, I like to use jig heads. I feel like I can control that shrimp a little better. So I'll, I'll pinch the tail off and I'll run the jig head up the anal cavity of the shrimp and then out of his his body. So that hook sitting out of it almost looks like one of his legs hanging out. Okay. And then when you pinch the tail off, now that jig head has almost became his tail. So that's what I would recommend in the summer if you're using primarily shrimp to fish at all times. Just try to go with the bigger shrimp. What size jig head? Uh, depending on, on how deep you're fishing, I like a quarter inch or, or an eighth inch jig head in shallow water. Okay. And anything from a quarter to a half inch to even a three eighths jig head um, in deeper water. Color and actually, matter. what's that? Color? I do not believe color matters. And that's just my opinion. Some people will say, oh, chartreuse green, white, red. I've caught them on every single one. I just buy the cheapest one because normally they eat it all the way and I have to cut it. And, you know, you're, you're catching them so fast sometimes you want to just you know, get a new hook on there. Okay. With the shrimp, uh, do you still have the, what, what do you say, uh, the, how much lead is there? You change it? Oh, no, yeah. If I'm using a shrimp, I'm primarily using a jig head. So no more knocker rig, no more weight sliding up and down. It's uh, line to line or line to leader, and my leader is tied to a jig head. Okay. Um, and inshore, a quarter ounce is fine, an eighth ounce even if it's, you know, you don't have a lot of tidal movement. Um, it's not a windy day. You can cast it still, you know, you can still cast it pretty far. And I wouldn't really say noise variance is, is something a snapper listens to because I've had the music blaring and still catch snapper all day. Um, some people do catch them on artificial. I'm not an artificial guy. He knows how much I hate. If it doesn't have a heartbeat, I'm not fishing with it. That's just how I roll. <laughs> Unless, or if it had a heartbeat, because I like cut bait too, especially in the summer months. Cut bait's a good thing to, to soak a bait. It's kind of a weight game, but um, if I'm fishing, it's, it's going to have a heartbeat or had a heartbeat at some point. So you're saying Rodney catch more bait or more fish than you than anyone else on the boat? Absolutely. Rodney, Rodney doesn't lose Rodney. a fish with a circle hook. Rodney the rod holder. Yeah, sure does. And look, guys, <clears throat> don't don't think that the back of any backwater, like cockroach bay or anything, do not hold mangrove snapper because there are some deep holes all the way in the back of cockroach bay that I know for a fact hold mangrove snapper. I would say almost every piece of major structure in the bay has a snapper on it. Depending on what the size of the school is or how big the snapper are, they're just such an abundant fish, they're there. I mean, it's like, uh, not as good as the Keys, but you go to the Keys, you can sit there. I mean, we, we go to Big Pine Key every year, and we just sit off the dock and catch yellowtail. I mean, it's, it's almost as abundant as that, especially at this time of year. It's a good piece of structure. It has bait around it, good current. There's going to be mangrove snapper there. So, again, it goes back to just plugging away, trying to find out, you know, keep a mental note. Or I like to use my phone. You get the memories on Facebook and stuff. So 
I'll be fishing one day and a memory will come up and I'll have you know a mess of snapper and I'm like oh, go into that hole again today because generally they're they're pattern fish they're gonna follow those same patterns they might not be in that same hole but they might be you know just around the corner from that hole on a different piece of structure so again you got to do your homework you got to plug away and and um, try to hunt to where the fish are but once you find them when you use some of these tactics you'll have no problem getting your limit and, and being able to take some home. When you're fishing deeper stretch or you're chunk, how, how deep are you pulling those threads up? How uh, deep? Depends anywhere from 30, 20 foot. Yeah, in the bay, yeah. yeah. So the easiest way for you guys to figure out which structure would work best, <clears throat> go buy a map. Because if you pull those maps up, the actual paper map, it will tell you every structure in the bay from a sunken boat to where a good uh, oyster bar is, the whole nine yards, they're all marked right there on that map. The Gandy tanks. The, yep, the Gandy tanks those are Those are a good. great place to snapper fish. I know a lot of people would be pretty mad, I just told you all that. <laughs> but um, There are no secret spots in the bay. Not honestly. at all. There's, there's no secret spots no. in the bay. Everybody Social knows. media and the amount of boaters we have and fishermen we have, it's it's hard to keep secrets. But, Almost always good to hear a yeah, Bahia Reef, Reef is a good one. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, it's probably, probably, I draw too much water. I, I'm not. I've got to have. I've got to have 31 inches. Okay. Yeah. So you. So you I got to. I got to. Yeah. Deep water. Yeah. Um, channels. The ledges. Channels. Run your channel. Um, I don't know if you like to troll for grouper, but when I'm trolling for grouper, I, I, I'm, I'm studying my bottom machine because yeah, I yeah. want to see. Yeah, well, well, there's a ledger I didn't know about. Well, there's a, I mean, a 31 foot boat. It's fuel consumption. Oh yeah. So it's kind of like you know, I mean, 12,000 pounds. It's a lot. Well, it's perfect for Bahia Beach, Port Manatee yeah. Reef, um, especially if that's the area you're yeah, I just go ahead and go into the cabin and turn the air conditioner on. <laughs> I, I do. I can go down and turn the air conditioner on. Absolutely. But the TV, you have to bring some snapper in. Watch the game. Right to the right, Yeah, right. Well, right to the oil. Ceviche. Fry them up right there. I say, I say there wins. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, that is the easiest because there's a lot of sunken ships in the bay that a lot of people don't realize. Like there's there's a sunken old shrimp boat right there in front of uh, Bahia Beach. Bahia Beach. There's an old sunken shrimp boat all the way over back in the kitchen. Believe it or not, the, the only time you can see it is in the winter time when it's a negative top. And that's you the go, one, that's one of these ones we know about. Well, yeah, that's the one that most of the time people know about it because their prop has gone. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, because no one has a clue about it and it can get shallow up there. Until they hit it. Until they hit it. When you hit it, you go, oh, there that thing is. Oops. With these, but yeah, that that map will mark every little spot that there is. There's so many; it would actually astonish you guys. That going, oh, I didn't even realize that was there. You would have no clue because some of the deeper areas, especially like in um, in front of Apollo Beach, there's a couple out there. People don't even realize they're out there because no one fishes them because they don't think about it. Now, granted, it may be a little bit harder to find when you're on your bottom machine, but you put the work in, you find it, you don't catch fish. Yeah. My some, bottom machine is my best friend when it comes to snapper fishing. And at, in, in 10 feet or more. When, when, again, when you're fishing 4 feet of water for snapper, obviously you're not using your bottom machine. You ever go, go off a of bait to the uh, Spanish, Spanish rocks? What's that? You ever go off a bait to the Spanish rocks? No, never been down there. Oh, yeah. Pretty good? Oh, yeah. It's only about 6 feet away, <coughs> but it's crystal clear. Oh, okay. So that's the place you're going to want to dial that leader back. Well, the problem down there is damn sharks. Sharks. And you get something on the line, you better have, have it in. On the boat, man, for 30 seconds. Get him in quick. Yeah. Tighten that drag down easy. and snatch him out of the water. You betcha. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions? Any any other tactics you guys might have used or try to use? Talk about right. Kobe. Kobe? Kobe is right now. Is on. Right place, right time. Anybody know what area to hunt or to target Cobia? Structures. No, not just structures. <clears throat> All the markers. Yep. Especially right there in Apollo. Towers, Beach. markers, tripods. And they don't call Big them the brown clown for nothing. Just Big look Dill's for the a brown. great place. Just don't get in that security zone. I made that mistake one day. Oh, you had to fit the cow come up on you? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, caught a, I, I caught a Cobia and I was by myself waiting on my wife. We were having a, staying at Little Harbor for our little weekend anniversary getaway and I was waiting on her so I said I'm gonna go see if there's Kobe or triple tail there first one I pull up I can see him circling he wasn't big I threw the bait out he ate it I got him in the boat so I'm trying to take a picture by myself well I didn't realize I was drifting and when I looked up I was about 50 yards into there and when I looked back they were already on their way so I just threw the fish out backed out real fast 
And they didn't say anything to me. They just kind of stayed off my bow. And as I moved to piling, they would move with me. And I'd move, and they'd move, and I'd move. And about 10 pilings later, he just jumps on plane and probably comes two feet off the front of my boat. I guess just to show me his boat was bigger than mine. Where is it? <laughs> McDill Air Force yeah. Base. Security zone. Great place to fish. Oh, yeah. But not a good place if you don't want to go to jail. <laughs> go to jail? I'll be more worried about the guy going 50 cows going through the jail. Yeah. Wow. Good. That's only if you don't stop. I mean, they give you a warning. They give you a warning shot first. <laughs> you know, this is one of the good things that I know about Cobia. They'll eat almost anything you throw at. Absolutely. But the number one, get a long black hose and a kingfish stinger rig. Where to go? Nice thin piece of black hose, or they had the big, you had the bigger uh, soft plastics back there. The hoagie eels. The hoagie eels. Just throw it out there, especially around structure. Just crank, little twitch, crank, little twitch. Boom. If, if I'm targeting Copia, I'm basically scouring the entire bay. I'm hitting every single marker, and I don't just run past them. I like to come off plane when I get to the marker and circle the marker three or four times. They're very curious fish, especially the vibration. It will, if there's one there, sometimes it'll bring them right up. So you're, They're stupid. You're sight fishing. Absolutely. Yeah, a Copia, is a, it's, it's hard to, to specifically target them. I mean, you can go and look at a bunch of places that they usually would be, but Cobia, 100%, is a right place, right time type of fish. So if you're hitting the can buoys, um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Even the manatee markers. Buoys, yep, manatee, the manatee markers. manatee markers. Anything that's just like a triple tail that's floating in the water can possibly hold a Cobia. Manatees, stingrays. Well, it's closing of all the sport fish for the another year. Is that going to put undue pressure on Cobia? Is that what all and snapper. It, it, it will, in turn. Because it's a meat fish. Well, triple I put tail. It this way. <clears throat> How big the Cobia can be inside the bay. The world record for an archery shot, Kobe, 79 pounds. 79 pounds shot by Steve Doherty. 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 <clears throat> 79 ago. pounds with a bow and arrow. That was a huge fish. Damn, I caught last year. I haven't caught any this year. I have not seen them. Normally, I'm, I'm not, like I said, I'm not targeting them. Last year, I was getting bait on said tower in the bay. <laughs> um, every morning I'd show up, I'd throw the net. And, I, and I, I learned something here. So I throw the net, and I'm pulling the net, and I can feel the bait in it, and all of a sudden I feel something tugging on my net. At first I thought something was caught in it. Well, as I'm, yeah, it was Kelly. Well, as I'm bringing it up, I see three cobia trying to eat the bait out of the back, back of my net. Well, I have a charter, so I have to get bait. So I was like, all right, I'll be with you guys in one minute. I continue to throw my net and get the bait. They followed it up every time. Um, three days in a row I showed up with the, to my charters to pick my clients up with a cobia in the box already. One of them was a 51 pounder. No, no, I'm sorry, 47 pounders, 51 inches, 47 pounds. So that was my best Kobe I've actually caught last year. Um, another good friend of ours, Mike Goodwine, pulls up. I'm like, hey, there was another one with him, and he wouldn't come back up. So I told Mike, I said, throw your net, get bait in it, pull it up, and hang it on the side of the boat. He did just that. That Kobe followed him right up. He dropped the bait in front of him, smoked him a Kobe at two. So there are things you can do to help corks them fish from being down there. But again, if you called me and said, hey, I want to book a charter for Kobe, I'd say, well, we can go catch some other stuff. We might get a Kobe. Because it, it's a right place, right time. There are some guys who are very good at timing when they like to be on these pieces of structure. And they might catch a little more than, than us, I'd say, average Joes, I guess. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel confident saying to someone, you know, You're, we're going to catch you a Kobe today 100%. Yeah. So most of the time it's going to be sight fishing. Yeah, it's they, a right. They don't right a time. brown clown for nothing. Mm -hmm. One, it looks like a big old brown turd floating around the, the mark. You'll think it's a shark. <clears throat> but then, but then, literally, you could throw anything at them and they're going to eat it. Yep. It's bucktail crazy. jigs. Bucktail yep. jigs probably the best thing to have. Whenever I'm fishing, like if I'm triple tail fishing or if I'm offshore, I always, excuse me, have a bucktail jig. It's the quickest thing that I can. If I see a cobia, I can. Grab it, unhook it, throw it in front of them, and you don't have to work it. Just let it fall. The feathers on that jig will move a little bit, and that Kobe will follow it right down. So that's probably, I would say, my go-to bait. If I'm targeting them, like in the winter, when all the manatees are at the, the viewing center and in Apollo Beach, great time to try to target Cobia. They buy those hoagie, like, 10-inch purple eels, and just take them, and when you see a manatee, throw it down the manatee and run it back, because those fish like to swim with big creatures for some reason. Whale sharks offshore, known for cobia. Um, East Coast, they have the manta ray run. The big nine foot manta rays are out there. I've had friends that have caught literally three, four, five man limits of cobia in an, a few hour period just chasing the rays around. 
Matter of fact, it was about a month ago that they were doing that. When so, Amy was pre-fishing with us last September <clears throat> for the redfish tournament, there was a big stingray in Big Pass, in Big Pass <clears throat> with a 48-inch Kobe on his back following it. And I'm talking maybe two feet of water. They're that crazy. So if you find, if you see a stingray from a distance, look a little bit behind it or look almost right on top of it because as they're kicking stuff up, they're eating like crazy. Or turtles. Yep. This time of year, we get a lot of sea turtles in the bay. You see a big sea turtle, throw something by it. There could be a cobia on it, under it. It could be 20 feet under him. He still might be cruising with that turtle. So it's, it's um, again, just trying to be at that right place at the right time. Cobia is probably one of the best yep. fish to, to ever eat that you can get. Oh, yeah. One, so plentiful. Two, the great fight you can get out of it. And they're delicious. Oh, absolutely. Grilled, <clears throat> fried, doesn't matter. You know, Ceviche. That, yeah, that was one of the biggest things I've ever learned from Mike Anderson. Very limited. But always have a rod on your boat ready for anything. Yep. You have your inshore, you know either you're going to have an artificial or if you're fishing live bait, live bait. You know you want one on there that's going to be a medium sized one. That way if you do see a Kobe or something, you can chunk it up there. You have a heavier one because next thing you know you see a couple tarpon run. <clears throat> you throw that tarpon bait out in front of them, now you've got something with backbone as you now have an opportunity to fight it. But always have something different ready to go. Not, oh let me sit there, clip this, tie something else on. Have it ready to go. All you got to do is put it in rod hole, pull it out of rod hole, un go with it. Easiest thing, if you're able to. If not, call Kelly. He'll hook you up with some rods. <laughs> Best rods in the business. Best rods out there. I promise Absolutely. you that. You got another seat of ICAST? I forgot to ask. <laughs> when, are you guys coming out with is the brute force out now? Yes. For a tarpon one? Mm -hmm. If you guys have not seen a great either offshore or a tarpon rod, check out that brute force. So I took that brute force out <clears throat> when I did a whole bunch of tuna fishing with Billy Nobles. Not a one of them gave me a bit of issue. I had a 3,000 pen clash on it with that brute force and no issues at all. That thing handling, it wasn't that great big long 20 minute fight where they're sitting there, they're running and then you got to reel them running. I handled it within less than 10 minutes, all of them. It's an amazing rod though, amazing rod. If you guys are looking for one, definitely check it out. Anything else crazy y'all want to talk about? Fishing wise, related? Triple tail? Triple tail? Ooh. <laughs> There's been a lot of heat on the triple tail. Um, no one fished in like two years they're ago. They're still still here. About the last two months is your, your March. March, into March, starting of April, a little bit of May. That's when I really like to target them. We'll have some studs here. Anything that's floating debris. I mean, you can even see, I've seen five gallon buckets yep. running back from the skyway from getting bait. And just said, let me go look at it. And there's been a huge triple tail in the bucket as it was floating upside down. There was a little bit of air pocket in the top to hold it. And I mean, there was a triple tail just literally in the mouth of the bucket sitting there. So anything that floats, um, just like Cobia, you're looking the the, the the markers, the pilings, the can buoys. Can buoys are great things to, uh, <coughs> oh, what's his name? I forget the guy's name. He sent me a picture not too long ago. We caught a 31 inch triple tail. He's seen a cobia on a can buoy in front of Apollo Beach. Frank? Little? No, not Lita. <coughs> um, Steven something. What's that? Good one caught a big one. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, Todd Young got one too. Like 27, 28 inches. That's a big, I mean, and it's some of the best eating you could ever have. Um, and triple tail or, there is a, there's a good way to target them crab traps. Things like that. Anything that's floating, really. Don't pull the crab trap up, though. Well, it happens. <laughs> Once in a while. You hook them, especially with me, I always fish live bait, so I mean, they'll swim around the crab trap, and sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. But. That's honestly the only way you can catch triple tail, you gotta use live bait. Because if you try just to drip shrimp, it past I love them, shrimp. Make sure I you have seen support. someone get them on the DOA shrimp, artificial. Again, that's not my cup of tea, so. If I'm targeting them, I'm using live, live, uh, usually live greenbacks or thread fins, but shrimp will do the trick too. <clears throat> and on that, those thread fins or even the greenbacks, make sure you hook them under this fin. Basically, I call it their armpit mm -hmm. because Pectoral. it makes them dive down. Because if they stay on top, you're not going to get it. You Gets them it. under the, the piece of structure you're yep. fishing. And almost every time you get close enough, you wouldn't think they're there. Boom, it's on. And you yeah. better be on your game because they will sit there and drag it down quick. <clears throat> wrap you around either that line or that structure and now you're SOL. 
I like to use a cork a lot fishing them. Um, sometimes if it's a strong current, so it's easier to trap a cork and actually easier to cast a cork when you have it on the line. So what I like to do is say my current's moving from the north part of the bay to the south part of the bay, I'm fishing a can buoy. I'm gonna throw my, my bobber past the buoy, I'm gonna reel it back to it, and I'm gonna let that current literally knock the bobber against the can buoy. I mean, it's right up on it. Because those triple tail are gonna be sitting right under that ledge where that buoy stops in the water, and you just want that bait kind of floating as close to them as possible, because they will peel off the structure to eat your bait, but they're not gonna go very far. So if you're casting, you know, 12, 15 yards off of the, the crab trap or the can buoy, it's probably not gonna come all the way out there and eat it. But if you use a bobber, it's easy to see, um, their bite is finicky. It, it, sometimes it won't take the bobber down right away. You'll, your bobber will be floating, and you'll, see, you'll notice a, just a different reaction in that bobber. Like, that wasn't supposed to do that. You start reeling down, and all of a sudden, drag starts peeling. Because sometimes they just eat it and not know they're hooked. So you, you gotta kinda be very aware to how you're fishing them. I like, you know, bobbers, live bait, or um, free line baits work as well. If the current's really strong and I'm using shrimp or something, I'll put a bobber on and I'll put a split shot right above the hook. That'll help keep that bait down under the can buoy or the crab buoy, whatever you're fishing. And uh, sometimes if you fish crab buoys, I almost don't even want to get this out. You have to fish the crab trap too. So remember, if you have current and you have a buoy here and that rope stretching to where the crab trap is, fish that crab trap because sometimes the little one will be up on the surface under the buoy but the big one you want the 30 incher the 25 incher he might be sitting on that crab trap because i've seen him in my friend's stone crab traps i mean he'll break into the crab traps just to eat the crabs so i like if i'm targeting a trying to target a bigger uh triple tail i'm fishing